Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank the organizers for having me, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you today uh, about the work that I've been doing in Ian Cousins' lab at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology in Constance. Um, um, like many of you here, I'm sure uh, we're all quite excited about collective behavior, and I'm particularly interested uh, in those, those uh, sort of collective faculties that come from um, um, interactions between individuals that are not, ex that are not exhibited by individuals themselves. Um, perhaps the most inter interesting of these are uh, the idea of collective perception. For example, we know that uh, collectives of fish can perceive uh, a large gradient that's well beyond the, the scope of their own uh, environment, uh, but through uh, individual detection and um, interaction among each other, they're able to perceive a gradient, for example. Um, so the idea is, so I, if I want to think about uh, collective perception, uh, decision-making, and cognition, uh, well, as a neuroscientist, this makes me think about uh, a very large field within neuroscience, uh, and that is uh, individual collective, uh, individual perception, decision-making, uh, and cognition. Uh, and so what I want to tell you about today is how my, um, my efforts to, to adapt so a very popular uh, experimental technique from neuroscience uh, to collective behavior. That task is this one. Uh, it's called the dot motion task for perceptual binary decisions. Uh, it's been in use for about the last 30 years, and it's been a very, very um, lucrative task for studying decision making. Uh, the task works like this. Uh, if I set some motion on, on these dots uh, with some degree of coherence, um, I, could, I could ask you now um, what direction is the, the majority of the motion. Uh, so maybe show of hands, who says the, the, the dots are moving to the left? Who says they're to the right? Okay, <laughs> good so far. So even though there is some component of, of random motion in here, you, can, you, you may be able to see that, there's, that not all the dots are moving to the right. Um, this was a pretty easy task. However, if we change the ratio of uh, coherent to incoherent motion, the task becomes a bit more difficult. And so if I ask you the same question again, who says that motion is to the left? Okay, who says it's to the right? Okay. Who's not sure? <laughs> uh, yeah, so clearly much more difficult with, uh, with a low coherence, low information. Um, congratulations to those of you who said it's to the right. Uh, you've, uh, your perceptual decision making is about on par with uh, the most highly trained monkeys. <laughs> um, this task has been adapted to lots of different organisms uh, over the last 30 years. Whoop. No? Are my videos going to play? Uh, so here on the left uh, is a rat performing the task. Here on the right is a, a human, I think. Um, and generally, the goal within neuroscience is to record neural activity and try to understand what neural mechanisms underlie uh, perceptual decision making. Why are all of these coming up at once? Okay. <laughs> Um, so here, for example, is an fMRI study done in humans during a perceptual decision-making task uh, where they identify a region of the brain that seems to uh, represent the accumulation of evidence, and they find that with uh, higher coherence, the evidence accumulates faster. Um, okay. um, similarly, in rats, using uh, olfactory mixtures, you can uh, identify neurons whose activity correlates more with the confidence in a decision. Uh, also, by mixing acoustic signals, you can uh, identify uh, neurons uh, whose activity records more with the, the readiness to make a decision than, than the evidence itself. Um, so my goal is to adapt this very lucrative system for studying decision making uh, to animal collectives, um, primarily with the goal of uh, using a, a very well-designed uh, experimental procedure to study, to learn something about uh, collective decisions and collective decisions. Uh, and my secondary goal is to maybe uh, be able to learn something uh, in general about um, a distributed uh, information processing that might inform something about uh, decision making in neuroscience. So how do I want to do this? Um, well, I'll take advantage of the fact that uh, fish schools respond to moving contrast, which I hope you can see. Oh, God. <laughs> 
Um, so here's about a thousand sun bleaks swimming in a tank, and I hope you can see that there are black dots projected on the floor of the tank, uh, and that the dots are moving in the same direction. Now looking from above, uh, you can see that the, the swarm of uh, the school of fish is uh, spinning in the same direction of the dots. Uh, and even as I change the direction of the stimulus, uh, the animals respond quite quickly and changing their direction as well. This is extremely robust. Uh, it works nearly 100% of the time uh, with large groups, small groups, uh, large tanks, small tanks. It's, a, it's an extremely robust response. Uh, and this forms the basis for how I will adapt the decision-making task to fish. Uh, the responses may be easier to see if I, uh, here now where we record uh, videos in infra infrared and we block the visual stimulus from the, the video so that we just see the activity of the fish. Um, and here in a second, you'll see the stimulus come on indicated by an arrow. Uh, and what you'll see that when the stimulus is congruent with the, the, the milling direction, uh, of course, they continue milling in that direction. And then as it switches, you'll see there'll be a, a moment of chaos, sort of, it seems uh, like the, the system becomes a bit unstable until it switches and the, the motion is then congruent with the stimulus. Um, so the way I'm thinking about it now is that this milling direction uh, represents a sort of bi-stable state of the system that can go in one direction or the other, and the stimulus is adding uh, um, um, influence to go in, in one direction or the other. Um, also in a second, I think you, the, you'll see the stimulus will stop. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see the, the milling direction persists. Um, so at least uh, to some extent, the, the information that was presented previously is still represented in the current state of, uh, the, by, by the milling direction. This may be analogous to uh, something like hysteresis or, or uh, working memory. Um, so we can track the fish uh, using a, a computer uh, vision software developed by a graduate student in the lab, Tristan Walter. Uh, and Tristan has really optimized the system to work really quickly so that we can collect lots of data with very large group sizes uh, and not be bogged down with, uh, with the long processing time that uh, a lot of uh, systems require. Um, so we get data that looks something like this. We can quantify the rotation direction um, by uh, just calculating the, the rotational order parameter um, but keeping the, the direction. So here, when presented with clockwise and counterclockwise rotation, you see that the order uh, parameter uh, goes from 0 to 1 to negative 1 uh, in response to the stimulus. So this lays the framework for uh, the adaptation of the random dot motion task to uh, fish schools. We simply uh, project patterns onto the floor of the tank, record them with camera, uh, and we can present a school with a, a very uh, easy decision to make or a relatively difficult one. Because there's uh, so many parameters in the system, uh, we developed a, a high throughput system to parallelize the, the data collection. Um, we have seven identical tanks uh, set up with projectors and, and uh, cameras and so on, uh, and we've developed a, a data analysis pipeline that, uh, that uh, gives us a trajectory data uh, synchronized with stimuli, stimulus information so that we can associate uh, the response of the, of the collectives to the uh, present, presentation of the stimulus. Um, so I'm still just in the early stages of analyzing the data that I've collected so far. Um, and for now, I'm just going to do a very um, sort of crude representation of the, the behavior by uh, thresholding the behavior in two different directions. Um, one is a threshold on the polarization parameter. So high polarization uh, gives us a polarized state. Um, and then when polarization is low, we give two thresholds, um, one representing when um, the Rotational order is high, uh, we get congruent milling. When it's low at negative one, we get incongruent milling. This is direct, directed in the opposite direction of the stimulus. Uh, and then in the middle is the, the swarm state. Uh, so now the task is quite, quite simple. We just um, present different uh, stimuli with different coherences to, to fish schools. Um, and for now, I'll just, just show you um, three levels of coherence, low, moderate, and high. These represent three difficulties, high, moderate, and low. Here's what the data typically look like. Oh, and you can't see. <laughs> um, there is a gray bar here representing what the stimulus is. It starts at about here, and it ends about here. <laughs> um, uh, so you'll see initially there's a, a, a swarm state in, in no matter what coherence the level the stimulus is. Um, this is likely just a startle response. Um, then the polarization drops because no matter what uh, the coherence level, there is generally some uh, a, a milling response. 
And then what's interesting then is, is the two different uh, milling responses, either in the congruent direction or incongruent direction. So first looking at the green, this is the low coherence level. You'll see that it's about the same um, in, in both congruent and incongruent. Um, but then if you look at the, at the high coherent uh, uh, experiments, um, there's an increase in congruent milling and a decrease in uh, incongruent milling. So I think this is uh, promising if we're, if we're um, trying to adapt the random dot motion task to, to fish. This tells us that a group of fish can indeed uh, perform the task, and they perform it better when it's easy, and they, they perform it poorly when it's difficult. Um, but is this collective? Um, well, if we vary the group size, we see that the performance drastically increases uh, with larger groups. So here I varied the group size from eight all the way up to 128. Um, and you'll see that uh, as the group size increases, the, the amplitude of the response increases, particularly uh, for the high and moderate uh, coherence levels. Uh, that's maybe easier to see if I show you just, uh, this is the, the mean success rate during the, the last half of the stimulus, the last 90 seconds. Um, and so here in green, is when the coherence is low, there's very little information presented. Uh, and no matter what the group size, they generally uh, have a success rate of about 50%. This means that they're, they're milling at, at random. Um, when the coherence is high, uh, for group sizes above, um, uh, with 16 and above, uh, it seems that they perform uh, maximally, um, suggesting that uh, even 16 fish is sufficient to detect a, a fairly strong signal in the, in, in the system. Uh, and then for uh, the more moderate levels, uh, it seems that the, the smaller group sizes perform very poorly, um, but it, it seems that uh, as the group size increases, the, they start to get better. Um, this is uh, still ongoing work, and I'm, um, in the next couple of months, I'll be expanding this plot in that direction all the way out to 4,096, uh, going in powers of two. Um, and also, uh, I'm working on more detailed data analysis, looking at local interactions, trying to find, for example, uh, points of divergence or, or measuring the stability of the, of the school um, before and after the correct or, or error responses. Um, so uh, for the last part of my talk, I want to introduce something that uh, is, uh, is uh, I haven't started yet. It's a, it's a um, um, collaboration that I'm excited about. Uh, and that is getting at the question of what social information is necessary for collective cognition. Um, so in the experiments I've shown you so far, it's very, very difficult to tease apart um, what information is social and what is asocial. Uh, in the collective response to, to the uh, moving dots paradigm. But if we move to a non-living system uh, or uh, a completely asocial system, we can start to tease these things apart. So I'm ex quite excited about a collaboration with uh, Cecilia Lozano. She's a postdoc uh, in the Beckinger group at the University of Constance, uh, and she's working with these synthetic microswimmers. Um, these are asymmetrically coated particles that respond to light uh, and will move uh, down a light gradient uh, um, with a, a quite an interesting re uh, relationship between the velocity and the intensity of light. So here, as the intensity increases, um, velocity increases up until a point where um, actually then um, at very high intensities, you actually get a positive phototaxis in the opposite direction. Um, so what you can do with these microswimmers is if you give them a light gradient, you expect them all to go in one direction from high to low, uh, as long as you stay within sort of this region. Um, so you can give successive uh, uh, gradients in like a sawtooth pattern. You can't see those dots at all, can you? <laughs> um, well, they're all moving to the right. This is probably the most difficult task this time. <laughs> um, uh, and so you can, we can drive uh, these particles continuously by giving repeated sawtooth patterns. Um, similar to what we did with the, the the fish task, if you orient the gradients in a circle, uh, you can uh, at least theoretically get continuous responses from the particles. Um, then of course, we can in theory flip some of the gradients to change the coherence of the stimulus uh, and, and ask uh, whether the, the group of particles as a whole will, will come to the correct solution of the, the gradient direction. Uh, so now we have I've shown you two methods for steering collective decisions, one in fish, where we just present them visual 
uh, stimuli, uh, one using these um, microswimming particles where we can moderate the coherence by changing the, the orientation of grids, uh, of gradients on a grid. Um, and we've come up with a strategy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, here in FISH, this is of course um, taking advantage of social information uh, and this is a completely asocial system. So we would expect that the FISH will perform this task uh, in a far superior way to these non-living asocial particles. However, if we can mimic some aspects of social interaction in this non-living system, we can determine what, what uh, components of social interaction are essential uh, for improving the, uh, the performance in this task. So we've come up with a way of how to do that, and that is, um, well, if I just quickly remind you of something probably no one in the room needs reminding of, the, uh, uh, a common model for social interaction in animals are these zones of attraction, orientation, and repulsion. Um, if, we, uh, if we project in closed loop uh, a gradient around each particle in the system um, that gives some information about its motion, so perhaps it's elongated in the direction of its motion or maybe its gradient represents the, the amplitude of its velocity, um, we can also reproduce these zones of attraction, alignment, and repulsion. Um, as particles come close to one another. So as, as a, one particle approaches another, they would attract. Uh, and then at this point of alignment, the, you switch to negative phototaxis and, and you get alignment. Uh, and then uh, collisions would, would represent the repulsion. So using this, we can test hypotheses about um, what's the minimum social information that's necessary to, um, to improve the, the performance of a detector, uh, in the, of a collective detector in a, in a noisy system. Uh, not only that, if we do repeated experiments uh, and uh, reward uh, successful detectors um, and allow them, allow them these parameters to vary on their own uh, in a, a sort of evolutionary loop, uh, we can ask how collective systems might evolve uh, 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 their behavior to, to improve their, their collective perception and cognition. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, first, thank everyone in the Department of Collective Behavior, um, uh, and especially those listed here who contributed directly to the work. Uh, and I'll take your questions. Thank you.